Hello, my name is Larry Pond. I'm a CPA in Redwood Shores, California, and I'm also a financial literacy volunteer for the California Society of CPAs. Today, we're going to talk about Schedule C and other small business taxes. And I am also here as a volunteer for the Internal Revenue Service. I'm going to read this disclaimer here that says that the instructor for this program volunteers his or her services as a public service and receives no compensation from the Internal Revenue Service, the IRS. Neither the instructor, business, or organization has a preferred relationship with the IRS. The IRS and the United States government do not endorse or guarantee the use of the instructor's services or business. Sponsoring or not sponsoring any organization with which the instructor has any relationship will not result in any special treatment from the Internal Revenue Services. So yes, I'm here as a volunteer, uh, helping them out uh, spread the word about business taxes. So today we're gonna to talk about Schedule C and small business taxes. So let's get started. So Schedule C are for sole proprietors. It's when you have your own uh, business and, and that gets reported on Schedule C. So let's take a look at the form right here. This is the 2021 version of Schedule C. So on the top, you enter your name, your social security number. Uh, line A, you enter the principal business or profession including the product or services you provide. In my case, I have a Schedule C and I put accounting as my principal business or profession. And then your business name, my name is Pond and Associates. Uh, box B, you enter your business code. So you take a look at the 10, the Schedule C instructions in the 1040 booklet for the list of codes. You wanna put the right code down because this is how the IRS will understand what kind of income and expenses you would have for your business. Every business has a, a different set of expenses. So it's um, so that code kind of helps to understand uh, what's appropriate there. And then enter your business address, your accounting method. Most of us are on the cash basis of accounting. What cash basis means is you report income when you receive it not when you bill it. Uh, you can use the accrual method of accounting. Basically, you report income when it is earned, when you sent the invoice to the customer, although you may have not received it. So generally, most people are on the cash basis of accounting. And then line one is gross receipt or sale. That's your gross income you earn from your business. Then we're going to go over the other lines of the Schedule C. So the first line is gross receipts, gross profit, and gross income. So that's what you're receiving for selling your product, selling your services, uh, or whatever you're doing, what kind of business you're doing. Uh, returns and allowances. And so those are like refunds or um, you know, if a client pays early, you give them an allowance and those sorts of things. Cost of goods sold is for the cost of your inventory, uh, those types of items. Uh, bartering is income. If you barter for services or barter for products, that's still income. It's just like cash. So you got to make sure you include your bartering. And then from your gross income, you can deduct your business expenses. And business expenses are anything that's ordinary and necessary for you to operate your business. So what we do not include under your business expenses are your personal expenses, your living expenses. Those kind of costs would not qualify. Many of us drive for our business. So we can deduct uh, business um, auto expenses. We'll go that into a little more detail in a second. And that also includes depreciation. That's when you buy equipment for your business. Other expenses could be legal fees, professional fees, and office expenses. Office expenses, including paying rent for your office, office supplies, um, uh, paying for subscriptions. A lot of our 
uh, a lot of our expenses are not subscription services for our software that you we need to use for our, our businesses. We, we pay for a lot of different kinds of software. If you have business travel, if you're traveling for business purposes, going to another location or going to a conference or those sorts of things, you can have business travel, but you can't deduct your vacations. Meals, well, entertainment's no longer deductible. So um, as, a, as, a, as the tax law changed effective in 2018, entertainment is no longer deductible, but meals are. Well, what's special for 2021 and 2022 is that meals are 100% deductible as long as they're provided by a restaurant. Now, in 2023, it will go back to the old law, which is 50% of meals are deductible. So when it comes to business meals, you have to keep track of, of who you're having a meal with and the business purpose for that meal. Now, as a result of the tax law change in 2021, meals for, provided by a restaurant are 100% deductible. It doesn't need to be consumed at the restaurant. You can have it as a takeout. However, uh, expenses for, uh, or meals from a grocery store, like a, a prepackaged salad or a sandwich, would not qualify. Getting those hot dogs at a gas station would not qualify. A food truck will qualify, but not a vending machine those will not count. But it's got to be a business purpose for all these expenses. There's a business purpose for the trip. They keep good records on that. Uh, business purpose for the meal. It's not just having lunch. We, we, we have lunch all the time, but there might not be a business purpose for it. It could be just a personal lunch. Uh, business supplies. You might need supplies for your business. You know, for tax returns, we, we use a lot of paper. So that's a, a big supply expense. We pay for software, all kinds of software, cloud software to store information on the cloud, our tax software, and a lot of specialty software that we use to make calculations. So for a lot of businesses, they have to license their software. So those are deductible. And then after subtracting your business expenses, you have your net profit or loss, and that's what we pay taxes on. So, uh, so we start with gross receipts, returns, allowances, cost of goods sold. How do you figure cost of goods sold? Well, not every business is going to have a cost of goods sold. If you're in a service business, you probably wouldn't have any cost of goods sold. I don't have any cost of goods sold because I'm not selling any inventory. But the cost of goods sold is computed as the cost of beginning inventory plus purchases minus personal items, minus the value of the ending inventory, your ending inventory. So that's why uh, uh, keeping track of your inventory is very important. And then there are services you can hire to um, help you compute your inventory. That's how you calculate the cost of goods sold. And there's a lot of different ways of doing it. In terms of income, always don't forget about bartering income. There's always a question when the IRS audits your tax return. So an audit doesn't mean you did anything wrong. It's just that you, you might have been picked for them to double check to make sure it's correct or numbers um, don't always look right on your tax return. That could trigger an audit. But you can go to the IRS website, irs.gov, and in the search box, type bartering tax centers. We've got a whole web page about that. And then there's IRS publication 525, taxable and non-taxable income for more about bartering information. All right, let's talk about car and truck expenses. Well, before the pandemic, a lot of us had quite a bit of, quite a bit of car and truck expenses because we drove around a lot to see our clients, to see our customers, to meet with colleagues, to have business meetings, either a conference, continuing education, or for whatever purpose. To get more details, look at IRS Publication 535. You can um, download that publication and have a lot more details. But when it comes to car and truck expenses, the deductible amount is your business use. So it's important to keep track of your mileage. And, you know, it's always a good idea to get your car serviced at the beginning of the year and at the end of the year, because by doing that, um, you have a record of what your odometer reading is. And that's always pretty helpful. So you know how many miles you drove for the year. And then you have on your calendar, 
keeping track of your mileage for business purposes. Maybe you, you, you went to Sacramento for a business meeting or San Francisco, whatever. So from, from your office to the, to the business location is deductible mileage. However, community expenses are not deductible. It doesn't matter if you're an independent, independent contractor or have your own business. Because if, you're, if you work in an office, that's commuting mileage. You can't deduct your community mileage. And that's a common mistake people make. They think that, that because they're self-employed, they can deduct all their mileage. And that's not true. Now, there's a couple of ways of calculating your car and truck expenses. There's the standard mileage rate. So the IRS uh, uh, issues that number every year. So for 2021, it's 56 cents a mile. For 2022, it's going to be 58 and a half cents a mile. Just keep track of your miles. A calendar is very helpful. There are apps you can get that, that will keep track of that for you. Or you can use what's called the actual uh, expense method, which means you keep track of all your auto expenses. And so that includes gas, insurance, repairs, and all those kind of costs. And then you take the ratio of your business mileage over your total mileage, and it gives you the percentage to use. Now, also part of the actual method calculation is depreciation. Now, on top of all these auto expenses, on top of the standard mileage rate or the actual method, you can also deduct parking fees and tolls. Again, those are for business uh, purposes. You're, you're driving to downtown San Francisco for a meeting. You go into a parking garage, you pay a fee there. That would be a deductible parking fee. A form 4562 is the form we use to calculate depreciation. And depreciation is a way, it's a deduction to recover the cost or other basis of business property. And it's for something to last for more than a year. Now, not everything qualifies for depreciation. Land, inventory, um, and property placed in service and retired in the same year are not depreciable. So you don't depreciate land. And if you bought something and got rid of the same year, that's not depreciable. It starts from the property's first use for business. So that's called placed in service. So for example, let's say I bought a piece of equipment, bought, bought a piece of equipment for my business. I get it. Let's say I got it in November. It sits in a box for, for, for a few months because I've been busy. I didn't get a chance to do it, use it. Well, you can't depreciate it until you take it out of the box and put it in service. And uh, I'm talking about an example of uh, you buy a computer, a brand new computer. It arrives in November, but it sits in the box until January of next year. And then by the time February comes along, you actually open it up, get it set up, plugged in and put in use. You can't take a depreciation deduction until it's placed in service when it is used. Now, it's important, whatever equipment you claim depreciation on, you're going to be using it um, for at least a period of its life. Most business equipment is five years. Because um, what happens if I buy a piece of equipment, I stop using it in year two? Well, there's something called recapture. You're going to recapture that depreciation you've taken. So you need to be careful about that because that can cause additional income without actually receiving income. So depreciation ends when the property is no longer used and the cost is fully recovered. In terms of calculating depreciation, you can take a look at publication 946. So there's two main methods of calculating depreciation. And we've had these with us for quite a few years now. We have what's called the Modified Accelerated Cost Recovery System, also known as makers, and that applies to most tangible products, most of the equipment. We buy a computer, we buy a scanner, a printer, uh, you know, that kind of business equipment, a shredding machine. And, and um, the recent tax law changes increased the additional first year of bonus depreciation deduction for qualifying property. So we have something called bonus depreciation, which means um, when you buy something new for your business, boom, you can get bonus depreciation. Or you can take what's called a section 179 deduction, which means you write it all, write it off all at once. So you elect to recover the cost of certain property in the year it's placed in service. Gotta watch out for the dollar limits, and that can change from year to year. 
And currently, recent tax law changes expand the benefit of full expense in, in limited circumstances. Well, I'm, 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 we're here in California, so you got to watch out for the California version of the tax law when it comes to depreciation. It's uh, not the same as the federal, so that's what can cause a what's called Fed Cal difference in the taxable income of a business. So let's talk about all these, some of these expenses. So you have legal and professional services and office expenses. So, you know, accountant fees, very important accountant fees, attorney fees, uh, very valuable things we do, fees for tax advice, preparing the tax return, all those sorts of things that would be deductible. Office supplies uh, that we use within the tax year, cost of materials and supplies that could include books, professional instruments, equipment, et cetera. It all depends on what your business is. And depending on your business, you might be buying certain supplies that are part of your business is fully deductible. However, someone else would not be because it's nothing to do with their business. So it all depends. So let me give you an example. For example, um, uh, there's a, there's a, a Bavarian band. You know, they're Bavarian band. They, they perform uh, all kinds of Bavarian music and they have uh, costumes. And part of their costume is Lederhosen, right? So that's part of their costume. They march in parades, they perform concerts, and they're dressed in Lederhosen. They buy instruments and for, to produce their music and all that. For them, that is fully deductible. That's a legitimate business expense. Well, what if I went and bought leader housing? Can I deduct it? No, I don't use it for business purposes. It would just be a personal item and wouldn't I look cute in those? So anyway, it really depends on the business and if that expense is ordinary and necessary for them. So it all depends on, on, on what it's for. Travel. So when it comes to travel, we got to be careful about this because you cannot deduct your vacations. That's not, that's personal. But lodging and business and transportation for overnight travel for business away from your tax home. So if your tax home is here in uh, Redwood City, California, uh, but I got to go to Sacramento for a meeting, it's a long drive. Um, so I'm going to stay there overnight. I'm doing some meetings there uh, for business reasons. That's okay. I can deduct those travel costs. Meals. Uh, meals are for when you're traveling for a business, you're out of town. That's okay. Meals are business related. Having lunch with a colleague or talking about business uh, with a customer or a potential customer um, or uh, an education meeting or, or things like that. When it comes to meals, you have a choice of using what's called the per diem rates or the actual expenses. But it doesn't matter which method you use, you still need to good, good, keep good records in your calendar about the purpose for that meal. And at the per diem rate, it's a table provided by the IRS. You look up, you look up the city you're, you're going to uh, because the costs vary from city to city and it'll provide the per diem rates to use. So it makes it a little bit easier. So the amount by which the gross income is more or less than expenses for the same period. So you start with part one, the gross income, minus the total expenses, part two. And then if you work from your home, which a lot of us are doing nowadays, the business use of home that's reported on form 8829, we deduct that also, gives you your net profit or loss. And that's the amount we pay taxes on. So not only do you pay income taxes on that net income, you also pay self-employment tax. Self-employment tax is social security and Medicare tax. It's 15.3%. So as a sole proprietor, a partner, you pay the both halves of it. When you're an employee, half is sticking out of your paycheck. The other half is paid by your employer. But when you're self-employed, you pay the whole amount, which is 15.3%. So you, you pay this when your uh, net profit for self-employment is more than $400. And we compute this on Schedule SC. That's how it gets calculated, gets calculated on Schedule SC. And then there are some limits. If you make, uh, you pay Social Security tax up to a certain amount, um, it depends on uh, what year we're talking about, the IRS updates or the Social Security Administration updates that amount. 
Now, how to pay taxes if you're self-employed? Well, you pay it via estimated taxes because when you're an employee working for an employer, they take it out of every check. It's withheld from your paycheck. But when you're self-employed, you have to pay them quarterly. And the due dates are April 15th, June 15th, September 15th, and January 15th. Now, the date can vary if the 15th it happens to be on a weekend, then it's the next business day. So for example, the first quarter estimated payment for 2022 is due on April 18th, 2022. Because uh, April 15th is on Saturday, April 17th, which is a Monday, is a federal holiday, Emancipation Day. So Tuesday, May 18th is the due date for the first quarter estimated payment. The estimated payment is your entire tax liability, a net of any credits. So it does include your self-employment tax and the federal income tax. Now, if it's more than $1,000, you'll need to make estimated payments and you pay this on form 1040ES. However, I always recommend paying it electronically. And then there's, uh, there's um, two ways to pay it. Uh, there's the EFTPS system, which is known as the Electronic Federal Tax Payment System, or you can pay on the IRS website at iris.gov slash direct pay. And just make sure you click on the right year, the current year, and click on that for estimated taxes. You input your bank information, uh, enter the date, you can do, enter this ahead of time. So for example, I, I wanna take care of uh, April, June, and September. Go ahead and plug it in now and the money will be taken out of your bank account as of those dates. The advantage of paying electronically is you don't have the risk of the IRS losing your checks or not cashing your payment. And that's something we've been seeing for the last couple of years. We had clients who wrote checks, but they never got cash or the payments got lost. And then the IRS will send you a letter saying, hey, you owe us money and here's a penalty. So to avoid those penalties, I recommend paying on the IRS website. You get a confirmation number and check your bank statement to make sure the payments are taken out of your account. Now, the question is, how much do I pay? Well, there's something called a safe harbor. A safe harbor means to avoid a penalty, you pay the lesser of 100% of last year or 90% of this year, whichever is less, you do the calculation. So if you know your income in 2022 is higher than 2021, use the 2021 amount. However, if your income is over $150,000, the, the uh, safe harbor threshold is 110% of last year. So it's April 15th, June 15th, September 15th, and January 15th. So those are the payment dates for your estimated payments. Now for California, that's 540 ES. California's a little bit different. It's 30% uh, in the first quarter, 40% in the second quarter, no payment in the third quarter, and then 30% in the fourth quarter. So California also has the same type of safe harbor thresholds, except for one exception. If you make over a million dollars you can't use the prior year threshold. You have to pay at least 90% of the current year. So there's some more points to remember here. So if you're in business less than the full year, well, you only deduct the expenses for the time that you're using uh, your home for business. So, so we're talking about the home office here. So if you work from home um, and you have an exclusive place for your home office, you can do that. Now, just a reminder with the home office that the home office deduction cannot create a loss. So if you're using the actual method, the, the, uh, if there's a loss, it gets carried over to future years. If you're using the simplified method, then it'll just be zero. Now, there's some special rules to consider if you use a home office, but it's sold at a profit. So there's some special rules you need to consider. You must keep detailed records to calculate the business use of the home. 
Take a look at IRS Publication 587 to get more information about this. So when calculating the home office deduction, you have a choice of two methods, the actual expense method, which would mean calculating your mortgage, property tax, insurance, utilities, and other expenses of maintaining the home, and, and also depreciation. Now, you, it's based upon the square footage of the room that you're using for the office and the entire house. So it's a ratio of that. But you can use the simplified method. The simplified method doesn't require you to maintain all those expenses, but you can still claim the deduction. It simplifies the calculation and record keeping. My recommendation, always have a floor plan of your house. You can either have the floor plan from the realtor or a floor plan from the architect who designed your house. Or if you're renting a property, you can get the floor plan from the landlord. Or if, you're, if it's your home, you can get the floor plan from the appraiser. They would have a floor plan there. So it doesn't matter if you're using the actual method or the simplified method. Now, the simplified method, it's kind of like the simplified uh, mileage rate for the auto expenses. Well, for home office, it's $5 a square foot. The maximum is 300 square feet. So if your actual home office is less than 300 square feet, then this works. Now, if your actual home office is much larger than that, I'm not going to recommend the simplified method. Use the actual method. Now, for daycare providers, there's some special calculations for the home office there because it's not just a room. It's probably the entire house in the backyard. Now, there's an allocation between the home office calculation and Schedule A. So Schedule A is where you deduct the property taxes and the mortgage deduction. So with the simplified method, there's no home depreciation or recapture when you sell your house. If you sell your house using the actual method, you'll have to recapture the depreciation you've taken. So you gotta look out for that. So it uh, doesn't matter which method you use, there's two requirements to qualify for a home office deduction. There's the regular and exclusive test. So that room is, is regularly used for the office, exclusively used for the office. So what you can't do is that's the same room when your baby sleeps. It's the guest room when, when you have guests come visiting and all that. It's got to be a real office. And it's the principal place of business. What that means is you can't have an office and have a home office too, because you already have a principal place of business. I know a lot of people say, well, you know, it's convenient because my office is half an hour away and I don't really want to, you know, always go there. So I'll work from home. But if you already have an office, you're not going to qualify for a home office. It's a little more complicated with the pandemic uh, where we're forced to work from home. If you're employed, it's a miscellaneous deduction, and there are no miscellaneous deductions right now. But if you're self-employed or in business for yourself, there, there could be a home office deduction. If that's the only place you're working, and you have no principal place of business. So the IRS can always catch this really easy. They'll look in your Schedule C. They look at the line for rent. It's like, how are you claiming a home office when you're also paying all this rent? It's only principal. What does principal mean? One. So the home office deduction cannot exceed the gross income from the business use of home, less business expenses. So you have a loss in the business, you're not going to get the home office deduction. So that's it for talking about Schedule C today. There's going to be other videos that we're doing, but uh, I'm a volunteer with the California Society of CPAs Financial Literacy Committee, but we're partnering with the IRS here to help you understand your business taxes. And the screen has my uh, contact information. Hey, you have any questions or any topics you'd like to see us cover, I'll let me know. Thank you very much and have a great day. Bye-bye.